Hi, I'm Ravi Kaza, Associate Professor in Radiology at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and I'll be talking about imaging of cystic pancreatic lesions. And no disclosures pertaining to this talk. And over the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be briefly discussing the characteristic imaging features of cystic pancreatic lesions, understand the rationale for imaging, and touch upon the current guidelines for management and role of radiologists. The first question we need to ask ourselves is why do we need to characterize cystic pancreatic lesions? And what we are trying to do is to assess the malignant potential of these lesions so that we can classify them as likely benign lesions such as pseudocyst, serocystadenoma, or an epithelial cyst, a potentially malignant lesion such as interdectal papillary mucinous neoplasm or a mucinous cystic neoplasm, or a definite malignant lesion such as solid pseudopapillary neoplasm or a cystic neuroendocrine tumor or a cystic appearing pancreatic cancer. So how do we do this? The first question we need to ask is to assess for presence of solid component which would suggest a solid tumor with cystic change within it and not a true cystic lesion. What are the solid tumors which can have cystic change? These would be solid pseudopapillary neoplasm, a cystic neuroendocrine tumor or a necrotic pancreatic adenocarcinoma. This is an example of a solid pseudopapillary neoplasm which on the initial look might look as a large cystic lesion which is seen on this T2 weighted images as a cystic T2 hyperintense lesion with multiple fluid fluid levels. However, if we closely look at the contrast enhanced CT scan and the contrast enhanced MR examination, there are nodular solid enhancing components along the periphery of the lesion suggesting that this is a solid lesion with cystic change. Another example of a solid pseudopapillary neoplasm which appears more complex with some cystic areas, solid components and areas of calcification within it. How about this case? If we look at this cystic lesion in the tail of pancreas, we see a 1.5 cm lesion and appears to be a cystic pancreatic lesion. However, notice that there is significant thickening of the gastric folds and this was a proven case of gastrinoma involving the tail of pancreas. Another example, on this axial T2 weighted image, we see a cystic lesion in the head of pancreas. And if you don't carefully look at the contrast enhanced portions of the MRI, you would be tempted to call this as an isolated cystic pancreatic lesion such as an IPMN. However, looking at the contrast MR, enhanced MR examination, we see a peripheral rim of enhancement suggesting that again this is a cystic neuroendocrine tumor and not a pancreatic cystic lesion. How about this case? In this case, we see a 1.5 cm cystic lesion in the body of pancreas and we could be tempted to call this as a cystic pancreatic lesion. However, close look at the scan shows that adjacent to this cystic lesion, we have a T2 intermediate lesion, which also shows heterogeneous enhancement following contrast administration along the medial aspect of the cystic lesion, suggesting that this was an actual pancreatic adenocarcinoma adjacent to a cystic lesion with associated pancreatic ductal dilation. Another example of a pancreatic adenocarcinoma with large areas of necrosis arising from the posterior aspect of the body of pancreas, which shows intermediate signal on T2 weighted images. So once we have excluded cystic change in a solid tumor, then we'd look for any history or changes of pancreatitis, suggesting that the lesion could be a pseudocyst. As we all know, pseudocysts develop in patients with history of prior episodes of pancreatitis and develop about four to six weeks after an acute attack. Pseudocysts by definition are amylase rich fluid collections within the pancreatic or peripancreatic tissue with, and have a thick fibrous wall. And on imaging, they appear as unilocular cysts with no enhancing septations or nodules and may communicate with the pancreatic duct with associated changes of acute or chronic pancreatitis in the adjacent pancreatic parenchyma. This is an example of a pseudocyst in a patient with acute pancreatitis wherein we see a 2 cm cystic lesion in the head of pancreas and changes of pancreatitis in the peripancreatic region. On the T2 weighted axial MR examinations, we notice the thick T2 hypointense fibrous rim around the lesion and some layering debris within it and there is no significant enhancement within the cyst or the layering debris within it confirming that this is a pseudocyst and not a cystic pancreatic neoplasm. Another example of a pseudocyst, in this example we do not see changes of acute pancreatitis, however this patient had a history of alcoholic pancreatitis 
and there was peripheral rim of calcification, suggesting chronic nature of the pseudocyst. Primary epithelial cysts of the pancreas are uncommon and are usually associated with von Hippel-Linda disease or adult polycystic kidney disease or history of cystic fibrosis. This is an example of a patient with von Hippel-Linda disease wherein we see multiple epithelial cysts in the pancreas, an enhancing right renal cell carcinoma, and an enhancing hemangioblastoma within the spinal canal as well. And once we have excluded the possibility of a cystic change in a solid tumor and a pseudocyst, then comes the differential diagnosis of a true cystic pancreatic neoplasm. And what we are trying to do is to identify characteristic imaging features which would guide us in the diagnosis of either a serous cystadenoma, a mucinous cystic neoplasm, or an IPMN. Serous cystadenoma is more common in females around 50 years of age and commonly noted in the head of pancreas. Classic imaging features of serous cystadenoma include a microcystic appearance, wherein the cysts are less than 2 cm in size, which give a characteristic sponge-like or honeycomb pattern, a central stellate fibrotic scar with calcification in serous cystadenoma is pathognomonic, and despite their large size, they rarely cause ductal obstruction. This is, these are two examples of typical appearance of serous cystadenoma, wherein on the image on the right, you have a large cystic lesion with a typical sponge-like appearance with multiple tiny cysts, and on the image on the left, we have a large cystic lesion with slightly larger cysts, but all the cysts have a size less than 1 cm. If we have a delayed phase on a CT scan, we can see delayed enhancement within the central fibrous scar as we see on this case. Stellate calcification in a central scar, if seen, is pretty characteristic of a serous cystadenoma as well. On ultrasound and CT, serous cystadenomas can appear as solid enhancing lesions given the tiny size of the cysts which cannot be distinguished on ultrasound and CT. As we see in this example, we see a hyperechoic lesion in the head of pancreas and on CT it appears more like a heterogeneous solid lesion. However, an MR examination done on the same patient shows that the lesion is hypointense on T1 weighted images and hyperintense on T2 weighted images with the typical appearance of multiple cysts within the lesion confirming diagnosis of serous cystadenoma. This is another example of a solid appearing serous cystadenoma on CT scan wherein we see a lesion in the head of pancreas which is homogeneously hyperdense on C the unenhanced CT and shows heterogeneous enhancement following contrast administration. On the MR examination, we see that lesion shows multiple tiny cysts and a central T2 hypointense scar confirming the diagnosis of a serous cystadenoma. As I had mentioned, despite the large size of the lesions, they rarely cause pancreatic ductal obstruction, as we see in this case with a 5 cm lesion in the head of pancreas without causing ductal obstruction. Compare that with a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, in this case wherein we see a 1 cm lesion in the body of pancreas which causes the pancreatic ductal obstruction early in the course of disease. However, it is important to note that serous cystadenoma can have atypical appearances such as macrocystic appearance in about 10 to 25 percent of the cases and are referred to as being oligocystic or unilocular and macrocystic serous cystadenomas are difficult to differentiate from mucinous cystic tumor. And as has shown in the previous examples, they can mimic a solid enhancing lesion such as a neuroendocrine tumor as well. This is an example of an oligocystic variant of serous cystadenoma, wherein we see a lobulated cystic lesion with few thin septations in tail of pancreas, and based on imaging, this would be impossible to distinguish from a mucinous cystic neoplasm. On endoscopic ultrasound-guided FNA, we can see cuboidal cells that stand for glycogen on cytology, and fluid analysis would show low MLAs and low CEA levels as well. The risk of malignancy in serous cystadenoma is extremely rare and surgery is offered if patient is symptomatic or if the cyst is more than 4 cm in size. If not, then serial imaging annually is to be considered. The next group of cystic pancreatic neoplasms we'll talk about is mucinous cystic neoplasm, which is more common again in females about 40 to 50 years of age, common in the body and tail of pancreas, 
and on imaging they appear as macrocystic lesions as seen as large cysts with thin septation and inspissated mucin can have variable appearance on MRI. Nodules and disorganized internal architecture and peripheral calcifications are associated with a higher degree of epithelial ATPA and mucinous cystic neoplasm typically do not communicate with the main pancreatic duct. This is an example of a mucinous cystic neoplasm wherein we see a large macrocystic lesion in the tail of pancreas with few thin septations along the inferior aspect of the lesion. These septations within a mucinous cystic neoplasm can be better depicted on MR as seen in this example. And inspissated mucin can appear hyperintense on T1 weighted images on MR examination as well. The lack of ductal communication between the cystic lesion and the pancreatic duct is easy to identify on curved planar reformed images which are helpful in evaluating the pancreas and the pancreatic duct. An endoscopic ultrasound guided FNA cytology can identify columnar cells that stain for mucin and cyst fluid analysis would show an elevated CEA and only mildly elevated amylase levels. All mucinous cystic neoplasms are thought to progress ultimate to, ultimately to malignancy and surgery is offered if patient is a suitable candidate. This is an example of a malignant change within a mucinous cystic neoplasm wherein we see a large cystic lesion in the tail of pancreas with nodular enhancing components along the wall of the cystic lesion as well as some enhancing lymph nodes in the retroperitoneum and hepatic metastasis as well. Another example of a malignant change within a mucinous cystic neoplasm wherein we see a large cystic lesion with solid nodular enhancing components. Patients un underwent a distal pancreatectomy with that confirmed diagnosis of malignant change within a mucinous cystic neoplasm. The next category of cystic pancreatic neoplasms we are going to talk about are intraductal papillary mucinous neoplasms which are defined as non-invasive mucin producing epithelial neoplasm arising within the main pancreatic duct or branch ducts. Based on the location of the mucin producing epithelial neoplasm, they are classified as branch duct, IPMN involving the branch ducts of the main pancreatic duct or main duct IPMN or a mixed variant involving both main duct and branch duct of the main pancreatic duct. Main duct IPMN is more common in males about 60 to 70 years of age and presents with diffuse dilation of main pancreatic duct and side branches. There is a high risk of malignancy with 65% risk of dysplasia or malignancy in about 5 years. This is an example of a main duct IPMN. On the initial CT scan on the top, we see diffuse dilation of the main pancreatic duct with the main pancreatic duct measuring up to 1 cm. And 2 years later, we see increasing dilation of the main pancreatic duct with the duct measuring up to 2 cm and dilated duct extending to the level of ampulla. Another example of main duct IPMN with associated pancreatic adenocarcinoma, we see diffuse dilation of the main pancreatic duct and side branches and in addition we see heterogeneous soft tissue arising from the uncertain process of pancreas with encasement of the mesenteric vessels due to an associated adenocarcinoma. Branch duct IPMN are more common in males about 60 to 70 years of age and common in the head and neck region. On imaging, branch duct IPMNs can appear macrocystic or microcystic and communicate with main pancreatic duct with associated ductal dilation. Notice that branch duct IPMNs are the only cystic lesions which can be multiple and can present with concomitant or recurrent pancreatitis. This is an example of a branch duct IPMN wherein we see a 1.5 cm cystic lesion in the uncertain process of pancreas which is seen to communicate with the main pancreatic duct through a mildly prominent branch duct. Another example of a branch duct IPMN on CT scan wherein we see a 2 cm cystic lesion which communicates with the main pancreatic duct with associated dilation of the main pancreatic duct downstream from the cystic lesion. An example of a multifocal branch duct IPMN wherein we see multiple cystic lesions in the body of pancreas with the cystic lesions measuring up to 2.5 cm. Notice absence of ductal dilation due to lack, lack of communication with the main pancreatic duct. 
an example of a mixed branch duct and main duct IPMN, wherein we see a macrocystic lesion in the head of pancreas communicating with the pancreatic duct with associated main pancreatic ductal dilation. Another example of a mixed branch duct and main duct IPMN, wherein we see a lobulated microcystic lesion in the unsnap process with associated diffuse ductal dilation, with dilated duct extending to the level of ampulla, and communication between the cystic lesion and the main pancreatic duct is again easily demonstrated on the curved planar reformated images. So, what are the features predicting malignancy on IPMN? With main duct IPMN, there is an associated high risk of malignancy. And with branch duct IPMN, we have these features called as worrisome features and high risk stigmata. Worrisome features, meaning concerning features for malignancy but not indicative of malignancy, include cyst size greater than 3 cm, a thick enhancing cyst wall, non enhancing mural nodule, or main pancreatic duct greater than 5 or 7 mm and high-risk stigmata suggesting that there is a definite li likelihood of malignancy include bile duct obstruction, presence of an enhancing solid nodule, or main pancreatic duct greater than 10 millimeters. How do we measure cyst size of IPMN? It's, we usually take the single longest outer wall-to-wall -wall diameter in any plane. As we can see in this example, on the axial plane, the cyst measures up about 1.7 centimeters. However, on the coronal plane, it measures up to 2.5 centimeters, and it's helpful to report the single longest diameter in any plane, as that is how the endoscopic ultrasounds would measure these lesions. We do not need to include the neck or the non-dilated portion of the branch duct. As seen in this example, you would only measure the cystic lesion and not include the non-dilated branch duct for measuring the lesion. If there's a cluster of cystic lesions, we report this as a single lesion as well. How do we identify thick enhancing wall? There's no well-defined threshold for wall thickening, but extrapolating what we use for renal cysts, we can assume that any wall which has more than 2 to 3 millimeter thickness would be considered thick enhancing wall. Post-contrast subtraction images of MRI are helpful in identifying thick enhancing wall but it is important to remember that this feature has a very low specificity of only about 60% in predicting malignancy. This is an example of an IPMN measuring up to 5 cm with thick enhancing wall and pathology confirmed intraductal carcinoma arising within a branch duct IPMN. Enhancing mural nodule is the single most independent predictor of malignant change in an IPMN with an associated eightfold increase in likelihood of malignancy. On this axial CT image, we see a cystic lesion in the head of pancreas with sub-centimeter enhancing nodules along the wall and pathology confirmed branch duct IPMN with high grade dysplasia. Globs of mucin can mimic enhancing mural nodules and MRI with post-contrast subtraction images are helpful in distinguishing mural nodules from inspissated mucin. Endoscopic ultrasound with Doppler imaging can also identify vascularity with the nodules and distinguish them from inspissated mucin. On this MR examination, we see a main duct IPMN with heterogeneous T2 intermediate signal components within the lesion, which are confirmed to be enhancing soft tissue on the post-contrast subtraction images, confirming the presence of an IPMN with associated pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And where do we measure the main pancreatic duct? Measure the widest diameter of main pancreatic duct, which could be distant from the main branch duct IPMN, and also look for enhancing wall or nodule with the main pancreatic duct. Also look for any focal stricture within the main pancreatic duct with associated parenchymal atrophy. As we see in this example, on the initial scan done on the right, we notice a 1.5 cm cystic lesion in the head of pancreas with not much of pancreatic ductal dilation, and seven months later, the cystic lesion in the head of pancreas is relatively unchanged in size, but there is more progressive ductal dilation, and at 18 months following the initial scan, the cystic lesion in head is unchanged in size, but there is more progressive pancreatic ductal dilation and parenchymal atrophy, and patient underwent a purple surgery with pathology confirming a combined IPMN with associated invasive adenocarcinoma. So how do we manage 
incidentally noted cystic pancreatic lesions. There are several management guidelines as I have listed here and the list keeps growing on. And we'll briefly discuss over the next couple of slides comparing the several guidelines which are available currently and future trends. The first guidelines which were published for management of incidental branch duct IPMN include the Sendai guidelines in 2006, which said that the cyst size of more than 3 cm or presence of a mural nodule or a dilated main pancreatic duct greater than 5 mm are associated with high risk of malignancy. So any patients with cysts showing these imaging features were offered surgery. However, these guidelines were revised in 2012 as a large number of benign cysts were being resected and the worrisome features were, high risk features were downgraded to worrisome features. So a cyst greater than three centimeters was only considered a worrisome feature and a mural nodule was considered a high risk feature only if it showed enhancing components. And if it was a non-enhancing mural nodule, it was only considered a worrisome feature. And the threshold for main pancreatic ductal dilation was also increased to more than 10 millimeter, wherein it would be a high risk feature and five to nine millimeter would only be considered a worrisome feature. Additional feature of a thick or enhancing wall was added as a worrisome feature. These guidelines were further revised in 2017 and the main change was that even an enhancing mural nodule less than 5 mm in size was now downgraded to a worrisome feature and only if the enhancing mural nodule was more than 5 mm it was considered a high risk feature and an additional feature of cyst growth was added wherein a cyst growing more than 5 mm in 2 years would be considered a worrisome feature. American College of Radiology has come up with guidelines of imaging of cystic pancreatic lesions in 2017, which closely reflect the reported guidelines of Fukuoka guidelines in 2012, with the only difference being that a duct cutoff of seven, more than 7 millimeters was considered a worrisome feature on the ACR guidelines, and the rate of cyst growth was subclassified based on the size of the cystic lesion. More recently, the European Study Group on Cystic Pancreatic Lesions have come up with their guidelines in 2018, wherein the, a cyst size of only more than 4 cm was considered a worrisome feature, and a cyst growth of only more than 5 mm per year was considered a worrisome feature, which is a higher threshold as compared to the revi revised Fukuoka guidelines or the ACR guidelines. American Gastroenterology and American College of Gastroenterology have also come up with some guidelines predicting malignancy in branch duct IPMN, with the AGA recommending that any cyst with more than 3 cm enhancing mural nodule or dilated main pancreatic duct with, with at least two features would should get an endoscopic ultrasound, whereas the American College of Gastroenterology would recommend that if any one feature is present, they, they would probably get an endoscopic ultrasound. What are the definite concerning features for pancreatic adenocarcinoma we need to look for in patients with branch duct IPMN? These include obstructive jaundice, main pancreatic ductal stricture with parenchymal atrophy, lymphadenopathy in the peripancreatic region, or an elevated CA19-9 level. So management of IPMN broadly falls under these three categories such as surgery, endoscopic ultrasound, and surveillance. Surgery is offered if there are presence of high-risk features or EUS FNA shows high-grade malignancy or patient is a younger age and we need to balance the risk of long-term surveillance versus the development of malignancy. Endoscopic ultrasound is offered if there is presence of worrisome features based on either the Fukuoka, ACR, or ACG guidelines which recommend endoscopic ultrasound if there is only one worrisome feature or the American Gastroenterology Association recommends endoscopic ultrasound if there are two features. Surveillance is offered if patient is asymptomatic and there are no concerning features on imaging and endoscopic ultrasound. So what are the recommendations for surveillance of IPMN? Again, comparing the different guidelines that we have, notice that each guidelines have separate starting points, for example, the Fukuoka guidelines, the ACG guidelines, and the European study group guidelines recommend cyst surveillance for 
suspected are IPMN, whereas the ACR and AGA guidelines are for surveillance of an incidental pancreatic cyst. Surveillance imaging interval could be from six months to two years based on the size of the lesion. So for example, a smaller lesion would, re would require a longer interval. And if the lesion is stable, then you could extend the interval of imaging on follow-ups. AGA recommends guide surveillance at one year interval and then biennially to year five. And how long do we surveil these pay lesions? Surveillance is offered as per the Fukuoka guidelines and the European guidelines until patient is unfit for surgery. According to the American College of Radiology guidelines, we can stop surveillance if the cyst is stable for 10 years or patients reach, reaches an age of about 80 years. ACR also guidelines also recommend that if a lesion is less than 5 millimeters in size, which is called as a white dot lesions, we just offer a one follow-up at two years, and if the cyst is stable, then no further follow-up may be needed. American College of Gastroenterology suggests that lesion should be followed up till patient is 75 years of age, and then maybe in patients of 75 to 85 years age. So which guidelines to follow? There's no right or wrong answer, and quality of evidence for all guidelines has been acknowledged to be poor. Guidelines provide a framework based on which individual patient management is formulated. For example, the larger the cyst, the shorter the imaging surveillance interval. And multidisciplinary discussion always helps in managing these patients. To summarize, how do we manage cystic pancreatic lesion? The first step that we need to consider is to exclude a solid mass presenting as a cystic lesion. As I've shown in this example, wherein we see a cystic neuroendocrine tumor mimicking a cystic pancreatic lesion, or a pancreatic adenocarcinoma associated with an adjacent cystic pancreatic lesion. And then we look for any classic appearance of subserous cyst adenoma or pseudocyst. For example, in this patient, we see a cystic lesion in the tail of pancreas, which could be a mucinous cystic neoplasm. However, notice that there is parenchymal atrophy of the pancreatic body and patient had a history of pancreatitis, suggesting that this is a pseudocyst. And in these two examples, we see classic imaging appearance of serous cystadenoma. And if you see such a microcystic lesion, so you should be calling this as a serous cystadenoma and not an IPMN. Once we have come to a conclusion that this is a likely IPMN, the next step to assess is this a low risk or a high risk IPMN. And we are trying to identify worrisome features and high risk imaging features which would guide the need for endoscopic ultrasound or surgery. And if none of those are present, we would classify this as a low risk IPMN and offer surveillance for these cystic lesions. This is an example of a patient with a one centimeter cystic lesion in the head of pancreas at presentation, which had no worrisome features, patient was followed up till four years, the cystic lesion grew to about three centimeters, and that six years later, we see further increase in size of this lesion with the few septations within it, and patient was offered a surgery at this time. Just a brief note about the various diagnostic methods we use for evaluating cystic pancreatic lesions. If you notice the slide, all imaging modalities have varying range of diagnostic accuracy. And the important thing to remember is that no single test can accurately differentiate between the types of cystic pancreatic tumors. So as a radiologist, our role is important in identifying morphological characteristics of cystic pancreatic lesions, identifying features concerning for malignancy in IPMN, and to be involved in multidisciplinary discussion which would help in management of these lesions. It's important to remember that guidelines for management are evolving with the trend towards being less aggressive in management of IPMN. Thank you.